Excellencies, Reverend Cannon, Your Honors, Distinguished Professors, Peacemakers, Ladies and Gentlemen. My name is Michael Nuri, and I am truly honored to serve as your host and to welcome you to the planet's first annual Peace Education Day Conference. This day is long overdue. With humanity facing so many challenges to its very survival, this gathering could not be more timely. The United Nations has declared this year, 2021, as the International Year of Peace and Trust. Today, we'll hear from some of the planet's leading peace educators. They are joining us from all over the globe, Africa, Asia, America, Australia, and Europe. Together, we'll be answering the question, why peace education? In a little bit, we'll open the chat so that you can give your answer. Right now, I'm going to use my privilege as a host to give you mine. You know me as an actor. Well, at least I hope you do. But when you see me acting, I want you to see someone else, the character I'm playing. Sometimes the good guy, sometimes not. But whoever I'm playing, I want you to believe my character is real. That doesn't just happen. I don't just show up on set and start acting. I have to study the script, research the character, rehearse my lines, and call on my training and the skills that I have acquired through long practice throughout my career. Now, isn't that true for most of us, no matter what our careers are? Uh, we go to school, we get training, gain skills and experience. We learn from our successes and from our failures. And we bring all of that to the challenges that are before us. Do we approach peace the same way? Is peace as important as our jobs? Do we educate ourselves, learn the skills, call upon our skills, grow from our successes and failures? Or do we just show up? Are we ready when we're faced with conflict, violence, inequity, and injustice? Or do we just improvise, just make it up as we go along? And if that's how we approach peace, just making it up as we go along, what do we think the outcome will be? Look around the globe and we can see the answer. If we prepared for peace the way that we prepare for war, we wouldn't be in this mess. And that's why I'm an ambassador for Seeds of Peace, preparing young leaders around the globe to be ready for peace with training, skills, knowledge, and experience to build a peaceful world. We must be ready for peace at every opportunity. It's not enough to lay down our swords and shields. We must pick up the plowshares. We must prepare ourselves and our children with the education, the skills, and the know-how to practice peace in every corner of the world. To be ready to face conflict, violence, inequity, and climate crisis with the power of peace. That's my answer to why peace education. What's yours? Let me tell you about our plan for the day. We have five topics, starting first with international relations. Second, we'll take a look at how some governments and NGOs are partnering to achieve surprising results through peace education. I have a special fondness for the third topic, arts and culture. I'm sorry to say that I won't be singing or dancing, but I still think that you're really going to enjoy it. In our fourth section, crises, climate, and ecosystems, We'll meet some remarkable activists and discover what they're doing to help us all survive. Finally, we'll be looking at strategies and structures for delivering peace education. Our speakers and panelists are joining us from all over the globe for this historic conference. Out of respect for them, we invite you to stay with us for the entire conference. To gather us all together in the same time zone, in the same virtual room, the presentations have been pre-recorded. If you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A below, and speakers will answer them on our website, peaceeducationday.com. If you're listening to the live stream, you can send your questions to our email, contact at peaceeducationday.com. Our next speaker, Ambassador Anwarul Chaduri, has long championed the global movement for a culture of peace. 
He served the United Nations as Senior Special Advisor to the UN General Assembly President, UN Under Secretary General, President of UNICEF Board, and Permanent Representative for Bangladesh. As High Representative of the UN, he advocated for the most vulnerable countries of the world. Under his leadership, the UN Security Council first recognized the role of women in peace and security. His long list of awards include the Uthant Peace Award, UNESCO Gandhi Gold Medal for Culture of Peace, Spirit of the UN Award, and University of Massachusetts Boston Chancellor's Medal for Global Leadership for Peace. Please welcome His Excellency Anwarul Chaduri. Greetings for the International Day of Peace, which is observed tomorrow all around the world. I thank Mr. Bill McCarthy, President and Founder of the Unity Foundation and Chair of this first annual World Peace Conference and Peace Education Network for organizing the conference with an excellent objective of getting the UN to declare a Peace Education Day. I believe it will be better if it is called the Global Peace Education Day. I am honored to be invited to speak at the conference as the inaugural keynote speaker on a subject which is very close to my heart and my persona. As I have stated on many occasions, my life's experience has taught me to value peace and equality as the essential components of our existence. Those unleash the positive forces of good that are so needed for human progress. Peace is integral to human existence. In everything we do, in everything we say, and in every thought we have, there is a place for peace. We should not isolate peace as something separate or distant. It is important to realize that the absence of peace takes away the opportunities that we need to better ourselves, to prepare ourselves, to empower ourselves to face the challenges of our lives, individually and collectively. For two decades and a half, my focus has been on advancing the culture of peace, which aims at making peace and nonviolence a part of our own self, our own personality, a part of our existence as a human being. And this will empower ourselves to contribute more effectively to bring inner as well as outer peace. This is the core of the self-transformational dimension of my advocacy around the globe for all ages with special emphasis on women, youth and children. This realization has now become more pertinent in the midst of the ever-increasing militarism and militarization that is destroying both our planet and our people. The International Congress on Peace in the Minds of Men was held in Yamasukru, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast in 1989 organized by UNESCO under the wise and dynamic leadership of my dear friend Federico Mayor Zaragoza, then UNESCO Director General who is joining this conference also as a keynote speaker. It was a landmark gathering to give a boost and a profile to the concept of the culture of peace, aimed at promoting a change of values 
and behaviors. On 13 September 1999, 22 years ago, last week, the United Nations adopted the Declaration and Program of Action on the Culture of Peace, a monumental document that transcends boundaries, cultures, societies, and nations. It was an honor for me to chair the nine-month-long negotiations that led to the adoption of this historic norm-setting document by the United Nations General Assembly. That document asserts that inherent in the culture of peace is a set of values, modes of behavior, and ways of life. A significant aspect of the essential message as articulated in the UN documents effectively asserts that culture of peace is a process of individual, collective, and institutional transformation. Transformation is the key word in this context. It is basic to remember that the culture of peace requires a change of our hearts, change of our mindset. It can be internalized through simple ways of living, changing our own behavior, changing how we relate to each other, changing how we connect with the oneness of humanity. The essence of the culture of peace is its message of inclusiveness and of global solidarity. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the United Nations in its Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, number 4.7 includes, among others, promotion of culture of peace and nonviolence, as well as global citizenship as part of the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. It, is, it also calls on the international community to ensure that all learners acquire those by the year 2030. Keeping that in focus, the theme of the United Nations High Level Forum in 2019, observing the 20th anniversary of the culture of peace at the UN, was, and I quote, the culture of peace dash empowering and transforming the humanity, end of quote, aiming at a forward-looking and inspiring agenda for the next 20 years. In my introduction to the 2008 publication, Peace Education, A Pathway to a Culture of Peace, I wrote, and I quote, as Maria Montessori had articulated so appropriately, those who want a violent way of living, prepare young people for that. But those who want peace have neglected their young children and adolescents, and that way are unable to organizing them for peace. In UNICEF, peace education is very succinctly defined as, and I quote, the process of promoting the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values needed to bring about behavior change that will enable children, youth, and adults to prevent conflict and violence, both overt and structural, to resolve conflict peacefully, and to create the conditions conducive to peace, whether at an 
interpersonal, intergroup, national or international levels. End of quote. Peace education needs to be accepted in all parts of the world, in all societies and countries as an essential element in creating the culture of peace. It deserves a radically different education, one that does not glorify war but educates for peace, non-violence and international cooperation. They need the skills and knowledge to create and nurture peace for their individual selves as well as for the world they, leave, they belong to. Never has it been more important for us to learn about the world and understand its diversity. The task of educating children and young people to find non-aggressive means to relate with one another is of primary importance. All educational institutions need to offer opportunities that prepare the students not only to live fulfilling lives but also to be responsible, conscious and productive citizens of the world. For that, educators need to introduce holistic and empowering curricula that cultivate a culture of peace in each and every young mind. Indeed, this should be more appropriately called education for global citizenship. Such learning cannot be achieved without well-intentioned, sustained and systematic peace education that leads the way to the culture of peace. If our minds could be likened to a computer, then education provides the software with which to reboot our priorities and actions away from violence towards the culture of peace. The global campaign for peace education has continued to contribute in a meaningful way towards this objective and must receive our continuous support. For this, I believe that early childhood affords a unique opportunity for us to sow the seeds of transition from the culture of war and violence to the culture of peace. The events that a child experiences early in life, the education that the child receives, and the community activities and socio-cultural mindset in which a child is immersed all contribute to how values, attitudes, traditions, modes of behavior and ways of life develop. We need to use this window of opportunity to instill the rudiments that each individual needs to become agents of peace and non-violence from an early life. Connecting the role of individuals to broader global objectives, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. affirmed that, and I quote him, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity." End of quote. The UN Program of Action on the Culture of Peace pays special attention to this aspect of an individual's self-transformation. In this context, I would reiterate that women in particular have a major role to play in promoting the culture of peace in our violence ridden societies, thereby bringing in lasting peace and reconciliation. 
women's equality makes our planet safe and secure. It is my strong belief that unless women are engaged in advancing the culture of peace at equal levels with men, sustainable peace would continue to elude us. We should always remember that without peace, development is impossible. And without development, peace is not achievable. But without women, neither peace nor development is conceivable. The work for peace is a continuous process and I'm convinced that the culture of peace is absolutely the most essential vehicle for realizing the goals and objectives of the United Nations in the 21st century. Let me conclude by urging all of you most certain, earnestly that we need to encourage the young people to be themselves, to build their own character, their own personality, which is embedded with understanding, tolerance and respect for, for diversity and in solidarity with the rest of humanity. We need to convey that to the young people. This is the minimum we can do as adults. We should do everything to empower them in the real sense. And such empowerment is going to stay with them for life. This is the significance of the culture of peace. It is not something temporary like resolving a conflict in one area or between communities without transforming the empower and empowering the people to sustain peace. Let us, yes, all of us, embrace the culture of peace for the good of humanity, for the sustainability of our planet, and for making our world a better place to live. I thank you. UN Trip is our recent collaboration with URI, where URI gave me the opportunity to have UN visit with them. I am Richa Sharma, representative of Think Round Inc. It was a two-day meet where we met different officials at managerial level who talked about their work. We learned about SDGs in UN 2030 agenda, learned about their process of work, and most importantly, signature solutions to them. I want to talk a little bit about SDGs, which is called Sustainable Development Goals. So UN um, sees all the pressing issues in the world and um, has made 17 out of them, which are the most pressing, pressing issues in the world right now. And they have included all of them in their UN 2030 agenda. And they want to improve in every uh, issue. Right from here, until 17 they have written all the issues which they are going to work until 2030 this trip provided a close-up view of how tri can fit in to serve the several common goals of the un uri and tri we understood the global reach of the un particularly as their reach relates to promoting world peace through the arts the environment and ending long-lasting conflicts between individuals, faiths, nations, and culture. We also understood the objectives of other CC members and their ways of addressing issues of interest or concern to them, and how all CC members can support each other in our respective processes. This has broadened our ability to collaborate, evaluate, and assimilate our shared interests in assimilating peace and manifesting the golden rule. The vastness of the UN as an entity number of countries which are involved in day-to-day -day betterment of the world is truly inspirational and how precisely every department is working towards achieving SDGs at the larger level is motivational. Through UN now, we understood the relativity of organizations like us at grassroots level and the UN which works at global level. 
this trip helped broaden our perspective and will eventually help to birth new ideas to serve one another and our code of ethics earth is home humans are family and at last as part of my un visit i was interviewed by martha galahu an alternate ecosoc representative at the un and coordinator of uri un circle and since my return from the un i have interviewed monica willard the main uri representative to the un and ellis sweat director of global programs I uri came to uri 3 years ago mm-hmm. and before that my career was about 25 years as an educator mm-hmm. working with high school and university age mm-hmm. students mm-hmm. on leadership and community engagement and determining how they wanted to be involved in their communities and what they could do to make their communities a better place and okay. supporting them to do that mm-hmm. So from my visit I can say that we are but a small drop in a vast sea of loving communion in our shared beliefs that earth is home and humans are family. We are happy to be able to row our boat in the wide wake of URI and the UN. We would like to give many thanks to URI to let us be a part of this wonderful trip which got us a lot closer with URI and other CC members and we would love to continue this relationship. When individuals fight they suffer when nations fight we all suffer how can peace education help nations get along our next speaker has decades of hands-on experience answering that question federico mayor zaragoza is one founder and president of the foundation for culture of peace fundacion cultura de paz he also started ubuntu a forum of civil society networks around the world As the Director General of UNESCO, he earned the respect of all 198 member states, the international scientific, cultural, and educational communities, and the press. He launched the Historic Culture of Peace program that addressed education for peace, human rights, and democracy, ending poverty, cultural diversity, and conflict prevention and resolution. Federico Mayor began his career as a researcher and professor of biochemistry at the University of Granada. He later became the Spanish Minister of Sciences and Education. He is the author of many scientific publications, is a poet, and has written widely about his lifelong pursuit of peace, universal democracy, sustainable human development, and human dignity. Please welcome Federico Mayor Zaragoza. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. I am very proud and very happy to participate in this excellent initiative and I will pay tribute to all those that uh, had this uh, joint pact for action in education in order that the peace education day the international peace education day will be a reality. before long and then we realize that is through education then the culture of war can be translated in a culture of peace and non-violence and this for this that I would like first of all to pay tribute to Anwar Chaudhry he is one of the founders of the culture of peace this culture of peace that started in Uh, Yamashukro in the year 1989 and uh, in the very heart of Africa what a wonder what a wise place Africa with so many suffering during centuries and now we are all equal in dignity now yes now is the moment by which we can put into practice through education this complete change in our behavior every day behavior through the agenda 2030 and the sustainable development goals and this for this that uh, i pay tribute to him very recently i have been with him also once more contributing to the UN high level forum on a culture of peace that took place in the 
United Nations headquarters in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, to Bill McCarthy, to David Weinberg, to all those, Elena Lopez Valcarcel, Prem Rawat, Bill Miller, to all those that contribute very visibly and in the first place to this initiative, thanks. Thanks because I repeat, I consider that this is extremely relevant. The United Nations Peace Education Day uh, will promote the transition, no doubt, from a culture of imposition, domination and war to a culture of encounter, conciliation, dialogue, alliance and peace. And therefore I join with much pleasure this uh, educators network, global network. This is very, very good. And I think that can be the origin of many very good initiatives related with education in the future. The leadership belongs to the scientific community, to the academic community, to the artistic community, to the intellectual community, philosophical. Yes, yes, we must realize education, educators. The voice to transform the education in such a way that worldwide must be the origin for citizens, world citizens, to be free and responsible. What a wonderful definition of what is education, to be free and responsible. This is how the article number one of UNESCO's constitution defines what education means. And it is for this that to be free and responsible, all the people of the world, in order not to be spectators anymore, not to be sometimes only being witness of what is happening. No, we must be actors of our own life and actors of what is happening. We cannot remain now as we have been during so many centuries, fearful, obedient, submitted, silence. No. Now, now we can speak. Now, for the first time in history, now, women and men, we are all equal. There is no discrimination anymore by gender or sexual sensibility or ideology or beliefs or ethnia. No, all human beings are unique. All human beings are equal in dignity. And now we can speak. Now we can express ourselves. Now we have voice. Now we cannot remain silent anymore. And uh, in this moment is in which we can, we can try to help to redress the present governance, neoliberal governance, plutocratic governance. What is this G6, G7, G8, G20? We are 196 countries. How can we then say that governance is in the hands of uh, six, seven, eight or twenty? Why? And uh, who has decided that this must be the reins of all human destiny in six, seven, eight or twenty hands? Why? Therefore, now we can change. Now we can change through education. We can promote the transition from a culture of uh, imposition, violence and war to a culture of encounter, conciliation and peace. Yes, now we can apply, apply, because we are free and responsible and we must apply this wonderful resolution of the United Nations General Assembly that at the end of the year 2015 provided this resolution 
to transform the world. It's fantastic. It's the first time that I see this kind of resolution to transform the world. And to transform the world with the Agenda 2030 and with the Sustainable Development Goals. Now we are responsible and therefore we know that most of the threats facing humanity as a whole are irreversible. Tomorrow can be late. Now we know that we must act, that we cannot once more disregard the calls made by these institutions, made by the educators. They say now we must be careful because, because if now we spend, invest in armament again, instead of changing completely, changing completely our action and implementing this Agenda 2030, this sustainable goal. Because we were, during many years, we have been calling, we have been telling the humanity that uh, there was this uh, tremendous risk of irreversible threats. And uh, we had a Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, and we had another summit in Johannesburg in 2002, and we published the Earth Charter to say, be careful, now uh, we must act immediately. And then we had the Culture of Peace resolution, and some years later, finally, finally, because a Democrat was the President of the United States of North America, because always the Republican Party rejects the multilateralism, rejects the United Nations. But with Obama, in uh, October, November 19, 2015, was signed the Agreement of Paris on climate change. What a word. And one month later, the resolution on the Agenda 2030. It was a moment of hope. But you know what happened? Immed immediately, Donald Trump said, no, I will not apply. I will not apply the Agenda 2030. I will not apply the Sustainable Development Goals. I will not apply the climate change. And silence. And the European Union, silent. And the rest of the country, silent. And we accepted what one country was deciding on the world. No. Now, now, International Peace Day, now the educators, now education means freedom and responsibility, must react. Now we must say, for the first time in history, with the peoples, yes, as it is said in the Charter of the United Nations, with the peoples will not remain silent anymore. Now, for the first time in history, we can say that we, the peoples, we will not accept anymore that every day, every day, more than $4 billion are invested in armament and military expenditures, while, while thousands of persons, most of them children from one to five years, die of hunger and extreme poverty, what is this? No, now we will have the leadership. Now the educators will educate in a culture of peace and non-violence. And now is for this that I am very happy that today we can promote this International Education for Peace Day. Now we can say to the humanity that we know that there are irresponsible irreversible threats, but that now we will act in order to prevent all this because we the peoples, we the peoples will implement the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030.
Why peace education? Dr. Tony Jenkins has been answering that question for decades as Managing Director of the International Institute of Peace Education, Coordinator of the Global Campaign for Peace Education, and as a lecturer in the Justice and Peace Program at Georgetown University. Here he is in conversation with Chris Dombach, President Emeritus of the National Peace Corps Association and former President of the Alliance for Peace Building. Thank you to, for the uh, very generous uh, introduction. I'm, I'm really honored to be here to moderate this panel on peace education and international relations. And I'm really fortunate today to be joined by some really remarkable guests, um, all who have a significant experience individually and through various organizations working on peace education in various international contexts. I'm also joined by Chick Dombach, an adjunct faculty at John Hopkins and American Universities and a Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow. He is President Emeritus of the National Peace Corps Association and former President of the Alliance for Peacebuilding. And he was nominated for the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. I think you've all probably heard a little uh, bit about me, but I wanted to um, just talk a little bit more about um, how my work centers peace education. Um, in an international context. So two of the hats that I wear are related to uh, coordinating two global networks of peace educators. One is the International Institute on Peace Education, which was founded in 1982 by Dr. Betty A. Reardon at Teachers College at Columbia University. At the time that project was founded, it was seeking to address the challenges of nuclear proliferation the Institute over the years has grown and expanded into a global community of peace educators who are dedicated to learning with and from each other. Uh, and we have a biennial gathering every few years hosted in a different country around the world where we bring together this network uh, and new folks as well to exchange ideas related to theory and practice in peace education. The other hat I wear is as the coordinator of the Global Campaign for Peace Education which was launched back in 1999 at the Hague Appeal for Peace Conference. This is the largest international peace conference in history with nearly 10,000 people from more than 100 countries gathered together in the Hague around the theme of exploring the possibility of abolishing war. So participants included hundreds of civil society leaders and representatives of more than 80 different governments and international organizations including at the time, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, the Prime Ministers of Bangladesh, the Netherlands, Queen Noor of Jordan, and several Nobel Peace Laureates. And one of the, the key conclusions of this conference, again, focus around the abolition of war, is that the questions that were generated and the possibilities of building a culture of peace would require the intentional, sustained, and systematic education for peace. And that is what the global campaign has been all about. Um, so uh, it is now currently um, a broad global network of individual educators and a coalition of various education NGOs, institutions, universities, and others committed to uh, peace education, seeking to build public awareness and political support for the introduction of peace education, particularly in formal contexts, but as well as the non-formal and outside of schools, and to promote the education of all teachers to teach for peace. So that's a little bit about the context in which, in which I worked, but I want to now uh, turn it over to our, our guests today to hear a little bit about the context in which they work, and maybe a little bit about um, the relevance of peace education and the work that they do. So first, I'd like to turn it over to Chick Dombach. Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it. And it's a real honor and privilege to be a part of this panel and, and the, the, the entire effort the, that is going forward. I'm enthusiastic about it. Look forward to following what happens as, as it develops and as we seek to make, a, make the world more peaceful. Um, my own background, I guess it's part of what people want to know, is, is you know, what I've done and, and how it relates to uh, uh, make the world more peaceful. Um, my history with, with the whole concept of peace goes back to the 60s. I'm an old guy, I'll admit it, and in many ways a product of the 60s. Um, I was a football player at a big school, Oklahoma State University, and people don't usually think of 
football players at the basic institutions as being interested in, in a subject like this. Um, and it, it wasn't when it started out, but uh, I, I saw some racial incidences happen within that athletic program. They were just appalling, absolutely appalling. And, but I didn't do anything about it. And then I felt guilty about not doing anything about it and resolved never again to let things like that happen without doing something about it. Uh, then I got, fortunately got hurt where I couldn't play anymore, which was a good thing, <laughs> but uh, got involved then with the, the campus activities that were going on, including the anti-war movement. Um, and I, I'd been ready to join the Marines and go fight the war in Vietnam until I did a little research on it and found out what a colossal mistake it was. So I took to the streets, marching in, in behalf of, of uh, finding a peaceful resolution to, to that war. Uh, but then thought, well, if that one's so messed up, what about the rest of them? And started then looking at it from a broad, broader perspective. Uh, joined the Peace Corps, which just opened and uh, served in Colombia, South America, which kind of opened my eyes to different people, different cultures, and an opportunity to learn to appreciate and respect them. Instead of uh, this, this notion that anybody that's different from us needs to be feared, uh, <laughs> so they, they need to be embraced, they need to be loved, we need to work together. So that, that was kind of the impact that the Peace Corps had on me. Uh, then kind of weave through several facets of, of uh, my earlier career, but uh, ended up um, ended up being the uh, president of the National Peace Corps Association, the organization of former Peace Corps volunteers, which is just as far as I'm concerned, the honor of a lifetime. Um, I had tried to make the Olympic team, didn't quite make it, but if I had a choice between winning Olympic gold medals and running the National Peace Corps Association, being a spokesperson for the people that have served in the Peace Corps, it's not a close call. I would take being president of the National Peace Corps Association any day. Uh, so I had the opportunity then to work with the Peace, the Peace Corps community. And that led to a, a remarkable experience. A guy named John Garamendi had been a Peace Corps volunteer. His, he and his wife had been Peace Corps volunteers in Ethiopia. And I got a phone call one day from John, said, check, my friends are killing each other and we've got to do something about it. And he was talking about the border war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And I said, John, I haven't a clue what we can do, but let's give it a try. And we got together and brought a few other uh, former Peace Corps volunteers into the team. Uh, we met with the embassies from both countries and they said, please help. We've gotten into a dreadful, brutal war and we can't figure out how to get out of it but we respect you as Peace Corps volunteers. We know you came to our countries to try to help make our countries more peaceful, more prosperous and more, more peaceful. So they trusted us and trust was the basis of it. But over a two year period, we built a, a very close relationship with the heads of state. We weren't getting paid, we were just some guys who thought we might be able to help out. Met with the heads of state and helped them find a way to resolve that war and when it was over, uh, we were invited to Algiers for the treaty signing ceremony and got a letter from um, Mela Sanawi, the prime minister of Ethiopia, thanking us for creating the spirit and the momentum that made that peace possible. Uh, and I've, I've always uh, cherished that. Uh, but one thing more important than, than the letter from the prime minister was meeting a, a street vendor at the corner of 18th and L in Washington, D.C., and you know those kiosks where you can get coffee and donuts and and, and hot dogs if you want. And I stopped and I and I got one and I recognized the lady in there. Looked like she was probably from the Horn of Africa. So I said, uh, asked where she was from. She probably said she was from Eritrea. I said, well, I, I'm not surprised. I, I thought that might be the case. I know you're president. To say it's a And she kind of looked at me like, who's ever heard of Eritrea and actually knows our president? I said, I'm Chick Dombach. And she just stopped and her eyes got big. And she said, I know you. I know who you are. You brought peace to my country. Like, wow, a street vendor in Washington, D.C. knew what we had done. And, was, and she bounded out and gave me a big hug. And we've been best of friends ever since. But that was an opportunity as a private citizen to do something to help bring about a, a peaceful resolution. As you know, it, it took a long time for that agreement to finally be put into place. And now of course they're, they're moving on to new dynamics of, of their violent conflict. But at least for a period of time, we were able to help bring about a peaceful resolution. 
That then uh, led to being brought in to, to run the Alliance for Peace Building, which you probably know is a, a network of people and organizations that are trying to build peace, trying to make a, a more peaceful world all over the world. Uh, also, uh, John Garamendi became a member of Commerce. He asked a, a member of Congress. He asked me to become his chief of staff, which I did. It was a great honor to do that. So, you know, we just had all these things that I just kind of stumbled into that were opportunities to do something about making the world more peaceful. And uh, the nomination for the, uh, the Nobel Prize was, I guess, a validation that maybe, maybe we actually did do some good out there. So that's, that's kind of my story of uh, what I've been involved with. And I think the message is that private citizens can do something. We can make a difference. And part of the value of peace education is we can raise and bring up a whole new generation that is aware of the importance of and the value of peace and what can be done. Uh, later on, I'll, I'll comment on a couple of other uh, things, including I'll, I'll go ahead and mention and then hope we, maybe we can come back to it later on. I got involved with something called the Institute for Economics and Peace, producers of the Global Peace Index. And I'm sure all of you are aware of the Global Peace Index and the value that it can have on peace education. That's what it's all about, is educating the public on, on what, what makes it possible for, for countries and societies to live at peace. And I have been on the board, worked very closely with Steve Killay, the founder and funder of Global Peace Index. So those are just some, some of the things that I've been able to do. And, every, and I guess probably the most important thing I get to do now, I you know, teach at American at Johns Hopkins, but I also get to travel to world, around the world giving lectures. And it's always built on the theme of making the world more peaceful. And that, that in and of itself is, is peace education, was able to give a TED talk called Why Not Peace? And so all of that is part of helping build a generation of citizens throughout the world who recognize the futility and the stupidity of using violence to solve our differences and instead finding peaceful means to do it. So that, that's my kind of an overview of what I've been able to do. Remarkable, Chick. I don't think I've heard your story before and I really appreciate hearing from you the importance of citizen diplomacy as a tool for peace building. I think it's often overlooked in the conversations that we have about peace building which we normally presume to be kind of a top-down approach, but we know the most effective transformative approaches are much more from the bottom up. Uh, and this kind of citizen diplomacy um, is really at the heart of peace education. I mean, I think one of the fundamental tasks of peace education is nurturing politically efficacious uh, citizens and actors. Uh, and your story is a perfect demonstration of that. So I'd, I'd like to... Um, move our, our conversation forward and center a little bit more on peace education now. And Chick, uh, you had alluded to um, the role of peace education a little bit in your work and your previous uh, comments. I wonder if you could build upon that a little bit more for us. How uh, and why do you think peace education is so vital to, to some of the, the tasks you talked about in terms of pursuing citizen diplomacy and, um, and so forth and so on? Uh, happy to. Uh, in from my perspective, anyway, the, the, the thing that, we, that needs to happen over the next years and, and decades is building a culture of peace worldwide. Uh, each country, each community in, in, in its own dynamics, in its own way, but uh, if, to the extent that we can build a culture of peace, uh, we can reduce the frequency and severity of violent conflict, and people will recognize that there are better alternatives to resolving our differences than resorting to the use of violent force. And you do that through education, you do that through peace education. And uh, to my mind, peace education can be manifest in, in many, many, many different ways. Uh, you know, the, uh, certainly it, in, in, the, in the school system, in, in, from kindergarten all the way through to graduation, uh, uh, just, just teaching the value of and the importance of uh, people respecting one another, one another's rights to live without fear of violence. Uh, I had, in addition to the other things, I had the privilege of working with Peter Yarrow, of Peter, Paul, and Mary, the uh, famous folk singer. And Peter created a program called Operation Respect, which is basically a peace education program that is, a, that is uh, used in elementary and middle schools, some high schools worldwide, and it's basically using music and, and examples and lessons to help children grow up with an understanding of the value of respecting one another and, and not resorting to the use of violence when they have disputes, 
So that, that is fundamental peace education in the school system. It's being used in some 25,000 schools all, all, all over the world. So that, that's just one example of a, a peace education, you know, for and building a culture of peace. Of course, at the uh, scholastic, or pardon me, at the uh, academic level, uh, colleges and universities, um, I, in, in my lectures, I often like to uh, say that when I went to college, if I had wanted to study peace, I couldn't do it because there were virtually no academic programs around the whole concept of building peace. If you wanted to study something about violence and conflict, you could learn how you could learn about war and how to win the next war. You would not learn about peace and how to prevent the next war. One of the phenomenal things that's happened over the last few decades is we're now literally for the first time in history have academic programs where people are studying and learning how to make the world more peaceful, not how to beat the guys that you don't like in the next war. We're, we're learning how to actually prevent the next war rather than just how to win the next war. I, I get excited about that, pardon me, but <laughs> uh, I, I just think that has, that has the potential of transforming the, the, the way we deal with one another. It'll take a couple generations for it to fully uh, penetrate our culture, but I think there's the opportunity for that to happen. And, and uh, there are now a couple of hundred academic programs where people can get master's and doctorate degrees in peace, in, in described and, and identified in many different ways. But that didn't exist 50 years ago. It's all over the place now. And I think it has the potential of uh, dramatically changing what happens in the world. Thank you very much, Chick. Um, I, one day I will share with you a funny story about my encounter with Peter Yarrow uh, at the UN in, in which he uh, happened to follow me as, as a speaker at an event with teachers. And he, um, he basically was giving a demonstration about how kids behave. And he looked straight at me in the eyes and said, I don't like you. I don't like the way you look. I don't like your glasses. And it was uh, the, one of the strangest encounters I've ever had. And Peter Yarrow is probably the nicest man in the world. Uh, of course, we understand the context, yeah, but yeah, it was funny uh, in the moment. Yeah. So, Chip, what, uh, what would you what would you like to to share or add about the, the challenges and the roles of peace education from your perspective and your experience? Well, I think the first challenge is to to get peace education respected as legitimate education. Um, there is a tendency, most certainly here in the U.S. I can't speak for the rest of the world. There's certainly a tendency here in the U.S. that whenever you start talking about peace, it's assumed that you're coming at it with a from a political perspective, quite frankly, a liberal political perspective. Um, and and uh, so I think educators are afraid to go there for fear they will be accused of, uh, of promoting a, a political agenda. Furthermore, this notion that we've always gone, we've always fought wars and always will fight wars. And there's nothing you can do about it. I think that pervades much of our culture. And so I, th I think it's really important to get the message out that it is, it is not necessarily political. In fact, it shouldn't be political at all. Uh, just learning the, the facts about, about the, the ability of societies to live in peace. And I hope we're getting over this notion that war is good for the economy. Coming out of World War II, you know, we, the, the economy prospered, therefore people said, so therefore world war is good for the economy. But we've just been fighting two major wars. How'd the economy do with uh, two wars going on over the last couple of decades? Not very well. Um, and, and I think there, there are a number of ways that we have learned. I'll, I'll turn to uh, my friend Steve Killay in the Global Peace Index and the, the work that he has done studying and, and revealing the correlation between peace and prosperity. And the correlation is not between war and prosperity. War is not a source of prosperity. Uh, but peace is, and if you read the documents that they've come up with, uh, with, with intense uh, detailed uh, analysis of, of the economies of the world, the, coral, the number one correlation is peaceful countries tend to be more prosperous, violent countries tend to be less prosperous, okay? <laughs> now, now, if we can look at that and recognize that reality and say, therefore, we ought to be teaching and building a culture of and teaching ways to make our societies less violent and more peaceful, that that leads to prosperity. Just that, that whole notion that permeates our culture, both the, the, the one about the political side of it and that war is necessary to stimulate economies. It just plain isn't, it is not political and it is, is certainly not good for economies. 
and, and that's you know, certainly one of the things that I build into my lectures. I get the opportunity to give them all over the world. Uh, and, and I would hope others would as well. If we can just start driving home those two basic themes, that war is not a political agenda, it is a human agenda, and that peace leads to prosperity far more than war leads to prosperity. So let's get behind a movement to do that. By the way, there are two outstanding books that have uh, that I think capture this, and particularly capture this notion that throughout history, war has led to prosperity. What we've learned is the world has actually become less violent and more peaceful. In the book, Humankind, the name of the author is slipping my mind right now, but uh, Humankind uh, illustrates this beautifully. And of course, Steven Pinker's The Better Angel of Our Nature is, is another one that documents the progress that we have made as human beings in becoming more peaceful and more prosperous at the same time. And what we need to do is capture that concept and, and, and that, that theory and apply it to what we do in our education going forward. Yeah, thank you, Chick. I think that that's a, a really important revelation that we need to, to make. Not so much a revelation. We actually have known about this for a long time. We could look at the work of Seymour Melman and, and mm -hmm. economic conversion related to disarmament and peace and economics and so forth. And that's such an important uh, linkage. And the work of the Institute for Economics and Peace has been really marvelous in really promoting and advancing that. So I, I want to pick up on uh, a point you started with, and I think that this it presents a, a big challenge for, for all of us on this panel, this notion that we need to legitimize peace education. Um, so there are a my myriad of obstacles and challenges to that, um, not just as you point out, the, the kind of threats, the perceived threats that educators and teachers have and bringing it into their classroom um, for, you know, concerning the perceptions that will be thrust upon them politically and so forth and so on. Um, but one of the things that I've found really fascinating in my work over the past uh, several years in particular is that we've seen the ways in which peace education most effectively gets integrated into curricula, into national curricula, is when it comes from the grassroots. When there is like a groundswell, uh, and this, this I think connects well with Chick's point of citizen diplomacy, but when there's this groundswell uh, that comes from NGOs and grassroots educational initiatives and others to bring peace education to the attention of political leaders and others to the point where essentially it can't be denied. And then that's when we see it um, being integrated into curricula uh, most successfully in a way in which it's sustained and not just kind of seen as, um, you, know, uh, you know, an educational intervention of a particular political moment, right? Um, but I mean, there are different experiences of this all around the world, but what are some ideas or opportunities do you think that we have for working towards legitimizing peace education uh, in various contexts in which you work uh, and all around the world? The, the peace education framework that you're putting forward, um, and it goes back to this whole idea from UNESCO, this idea that peace begins with the minds of men. Um, and centering reflection is such a really integral kind of pedagogical um, process that we use in peace education. Chick. Uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, I, I think those of us involved in peace and the big peace building community need to think strategically about how to have an impact on peace education uh, and start to uh, connect with the, the uh, education associations, the, uh, the curriculum development people and the uh, elementary school principals, for example, uh, we had the opportunity to work with Peter. We could get in because everybody wanted to hear Peter sing. So we could get in and, and meet with them, talk with them about uh, dealing with uh, bullying, ridicule and violence in schools. Um, and, and that has made somewhat of a difference, but it's just a, a drop in the bucket compared with what needs to happen but we were able to connect with all of those education related associations and help them understand what could be done in, in the classrooms and in the schools throughout the country and throughout the world to help bring this, this about. So I think uh, we need to consciously and intentionally reach out to the education community and, and uh, you know, build a relationship there and an understanding of the, the potential value of building peace education into overall education. Uh, but in addition to that, things like what Rotary International is doing, I think is, is quite remarkable. Rotary, of course, is kind of the, the, the big daddy of uh, the uh, social service, community social service organizations. 
And they have made building peace one of their top six priorities. And in fact, Steve Killay and his program is providing training literally to tens of thousands of Rotarians all across the world on the concept of, of uh, positive peace and uh, what can be done to make the world more peaceful. So I guess my, my point simply is to be intentional and strategic about reaching the educators and helping them understand the importance of and the value of peace and peace education and, and uh, getting it incorporated into school systems and into curricula. Fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to, to share that you think is really important for us to understand about your work, about the challenges or obstacles to peace education or opportunities that are put forward for us? Anything else you'd just like to share really quickly? Um, let me turn it over to Chick first. All right. Uh, the, the, the main thing for me is bringing along a new generation of people who understand and are committed to this. And frankly, I'm encouraged. I see the young people that are coming along and doing phenomenal things. I happen to be very, very close to two remarkable young people who are doing this. Uh, Victor O'Chen, some of you may know or know of Victor, uh, the UN, when they established Goal 16, Sustainable Development Goals, they named Victor as their un unofficial global ambassador for Goal 16. And, and if you know Victor and his background, and we may be able to share a short video that just uh, would introduce you to Victor, but it's it just an, an example of young people making an incredible difference. Victor was born and raised in a displaced persons camp, Northern Uganda, his family was attacked by the Lord's Resistance Army, he was tempted to take up arms and fight back. But as a 13 year old boy, who all he had known was hunger and violence in this camp that he grew up with, just thought, wait a second, if I become violent, that just perpetuates the violence. He said, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I will never touch a gun. And he started a youth movement there in northern Uganda that is now spread throughout Africa. And he is known and admired by uh, heads of state, by uh, UN secretaries general. They, the, the last three or four have all come to know Victor and, and admire him. So, you know, I look at people like Victor. He's my dear, dear friend. He stays at my house when he comes to the U.S., um, and, uh, but uh, we see, see young people like Victor coming along. Another, and I just throw this out as examples of what I'm seeing with the young, young leadership in this movement. Riada Asimovic Akio is a young lady from uh, Sarajevo who was, came close to being a victim of the genocide that took place there about 20 years ago. Uh, but, but she was fortunate to survive it and is now a, a leading spokesperson certainly for, for women and women's rights, but for, uh, uh, for a, a building a more peaceful world and particularly looking at the world of Islam and, and how it's gotten off track and, and into too much violence and that, that there is a movement within Islam uh, with uh, uh, Riyadh and her husband, uh, Mustafa, uh, providing an intellectual and historic framework for uh, 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 abandoning this, this ludicrous notion that some of them seem to have come up with, that they had the right and reason to use violence to, to promote uh, their ideologies. And it's just plain wrong. And we've got wonderful people like Mustafa and Riyadh who are taking the lead in making sure that that re-education and a new concept of what it means to be a Muslim is catches hold around the world. So I think we identify these extraordinary young people and what they can do going forward for, for decades to be to help bring about this change in the world. And fantastic. So you're really strategically centering youth is so important. And we're seeing so many uh, NGOs and UN agencies really making an intentional effort right now to do that. Youth have been so for so long excluded from these conversations around peace building. And that's really tragic. And we're seeing that not only are they the most impacted by war and conflict, uh, or amongst the most impacted uh, populations along with women. Um, so we, we you know, bringing their voices in is really important. And we are actually working on a, an effort to try to find ways to train students to become advocates for calling for peace education in their schools. And uh, your comments just remind me of the real central importance of thinking about the future that peace education brings. Um, and so we certainly post pandemic, we don't wanna go back to normal if anything, um, the, the pandemic has revealed to so many people around the world of uh, various injustices of structural and racial violence that, that, were, that have been with us all along, but just became much more visible. 
Uh, and so how do we move forward to a future that's more sustainable, more just, more peaceful? And that's one of the things that I think we have uh, to look forward to. It's not as bad as it looks Family members gone missing and the world being shook And nothing can really make up for the time that it took We've been locked down and trapped in the house now For months in the background, no justice we act out We can't trust a soul now, so why don't we start from the place within Hoping a new tomorrow, but joy in life can begin, yeah But first, we need to cleanse our We need to cleanse our souls We need to cleanse our We need to cleanse our Not as bad as it looks Family members gone missing And the world being shook And nothing can really make up For the time that it took We've been locked down And trapped in the house now For months in the background No justice we act out We can't trust a soul now So why don't we start From the place within Hoping a new tomorrow But joy in life can begin Yeah But first We need to cleanse our We need to cleanse our souls We need to cleanse our 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 souls. We need to cleanse our souls. We need to cleanse our souls. Our next speaker, Prem Rawat, began speaking publicly about peace at the age of four years old. He's been awarded the honorary title of Global Ambassador of Peace from the European Parliament's Pledge to Peace the United Nations University of Peace in Brazil, and other organizations. For more than 50 years, he has traveled the world reaching millions with the message that peace is a fundamental human right, a fundamental human need, and a fundamental human responsibility. He is the founder of the Peace Education Program, a series of workshops that help people discover their inner strength and reflect on their own humanity. His foundation partners with NGOs, governments, schools, law enforcement, and other groups, and individual volunteers in more than 80 countries across six continents. In post-conflict zones, the program has helped heal the wounds of victims and ex-combatants. Please welcome Prem Rawat to the first Global Peace Education Day conference. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it's a great pleasure to be addressing you today. My name is Prem Rawat. And I'm the founder of the Prem Rawat Foundation, which puts out the Peace Education Program. The Peace Education Program has been incredibly successful. And I would just like to give you a little bit of background as it relates to the Peace Education Program. It has uh, over 160,000 participants, over 70 countries and in 35 languages. It has been seen and has affected 60,000 plus people in the correctional facilities in 40 countries. In over 600 educational facilities and over 40,000 people have been able to attend and have the benefit of it. 
and it is enjoyed by communities, by health and wellness, by nonprofits, NGOs, civic governments, senior centers, police and law enforcement, military and veterans, and homeless shelters. So, of course, why is the peace education program so successful? And here, what we really have to understand is a, a very, very ancient statement that was made by Socrates. Know thyself. Something that puts us in touch with who we as human beings are. And Peace Education Program does exactly that. So many of our society's problems really arise from us going away from ourselves. And as more and more we march towards what other people think, what other people think is cool, what other people dictate to us, we go away from who truly we are. We forget that we are human beings, that we have certain needs, and I'm going to make a little distinction here between needs and wants. Because wants are abundant. And even when satisfied, we are never satisfied with our wants because they keep changing. The needs, on the other hand, are very, very important for us. And we sometimes forget that there are things that we need in our we need kindness. We need understanding. We need joy. We need clarity. These are important things. And when we do not have them, we become alienated. But we don't become alienated from the world. We become alienated from ourselves. And when we are alienated from ourselves, Truly, what a human being should be like goes away from us. We no longer understand that simple need to be kind, that simple need to be full of understanding. And all of a sudden, even in environments that should be full of love, full of encouragement, full of understanding, you find yourself that people are fighting. When people are fighting at home, when people are fighting with themselves, this is going to be sooner or later an expression that is going to come out in this world. And before you know it, you've got wars everywhere. Before you know it, you've got people who are angry, angry, because they really don't understand what they are all about. They are frustrated because 24-7 they think they have to fulfill other people's expectations of them. Look at social media. It's full of it. Look at, look at the person of today. They don't have time to even just drive a car properly. They're driving and they're talking, they're driving and they're texting, and so many accidents happen. Because people really are caught up in trying to fulfill not their expectation of themselves, but other people's expectations of them. What happens? Frustration happens. What happens? Anger happens. What happens? Unsatisfaction happens. And we move away from the simple peace of being a human being. We move away from that simple understanding of being a human being. And when that happens, 
It really takes something to awaken us again. The peace education program is profoundly simple. It puts people in touch with themselves. And when they are in touch with themselves, what do they find? They find hope. They find hope which is so important for a human being. Hope is hope. It is the light. It is somebody turning on a light in a very, very, very dark environment. The light doesn't need to be very bright. Just a little bit of light goes a long ways in illuminating our path. We don't need somebody to come along and sweep our path. We want somebody to just simply come and illuminate our path. So we can see the obstacles and we can go around. As, as human beings, we are very good at circumnavigating the obstacles that are around only if we can see them. If we can't see them, then we keep bumping into them. And this causes frustration. This causes anger. This causes fear. That causes worries. And if you look around, the world is full of it. I'm not saying that this is a bad world. There are good people here. And there is goodness. Even in the dire situation, there is goodness in people. But it has to be brought out. And Peace Education Program exactly does that. Because it puts people in touch with themselves. That's its forte. That's its little clever little niche, if you will, of how it works. It makes that possible for people. And it's amazing that when people come back to themselves, they find joy. They find a very different kind of happiness. Not the entertainment kind of happiness, but of a happiness of coming home where you understand that, yes, these things did not need to happen the way they happen. And I'm talking about the correctional facilities where people end up. And some of them are in those correctional facilities for life. What happens? On one hand, government creates so many regulations and police and jails and everything. And on the other hand, you have a peace education program that successfully in Talangana, a state in India, closed down five prisons because the people who were once released, the inmates that were released, did not come back. They did not want to come back. So they had to close down five prisons. This is what Peace Education Program has done. Not that it can do, it has done. This has happened. And everywhere that I go, to especially the corrections facilities, I see people are so thankful so thankful. And they say that, you know, if I had known this program ahead of time, I would have never been in this prison. I would have never done this. This is also true for the, the people I met in from Sri Lanka who had been fighting with the Tamil Tigers. This is also true of the people who were the guerrillas in, um, in, uh, in Colombia. So, when a human being can be allowed to be in touch with themselves, amazing things can happen. And Peace Education Program does exactly that. So thank you for letting me talk.
talk to you about the peace education program and please all of you be safe and be in touch with yourself thank you
A Nigerian proverb says, a man cannot sit down alone to plan for prosperity. Our next speaker proves this every day. Dr. Stefan Monet Moanju is Director General of the African Training and Research Center in Administration for Development, known as CAFRAD. The center, located in Tangier, Morocco, was established with support from UNESCO, and it is the first uniquely pan-African center of its kind. There are 37 members, and all African countries are free to join. Dr. Monet Mwanjo holds a PhD in International Law and International Relations from the French University of Rheims, Champagne, Ardennes. Please welcome him to the first Global Peace Education Day conference. Bonjour, uh, mesdames et messieurs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and good morning to those who are participating in this panel. I'd like first, and after all, to respect the tradition, which is to thank you for having you associate the CAFRAD and me personally in this important meeting, talking about the culture of peace and peace education. I would like to honor the conceptor, the designer of this idea that became important today in the world that is ours today. Dr. Federico Mayor, who have inspired professors from universities, experts, diplomats, in general about this idea of peace education. I would like to express my gratitude to him for the interest he has for Africa and the interest he has for our institution, CAFRAD, in particular. I'd like to thank the organizers who have accompanied this work in a practical way, on a technical way, to make this meeting possible that we have today about peace education. I'm asked to talk about the culture of peace and the peace education in the missions that are ours. CAFRAD is a pan-African intergovernmental organization that was created in the beginning of the independence around 1964, and our mission was to accompany the new governments building their administration. And for us, we had to gather the different experiences from the continent and getting help from other regions of the world to build little by little a spirit and a practical way of dealing the administrations according to the expectations of our new independent states. That's how our mission was built. I have to say that the education of peace culture in the African context is consubstantial of our mission. Because Africa, our continent, have been built with turbulences in all kinds. Some of the independent was obtained after wars, after conflicts, after belligerence. And there was a difficulty in the negotiation between the colonial states and the countries that had gained their new independence. And this negotiation took place in a conflictual environment. And we had to wait for the two parties to start constructing, thinking about the construction of peace and prosperity. And that's how this institution that I'm managing since now 10 years had been moving little by little by learning from its member states to start building strategies founded on ethic, founded on a strategy 
to attain specific goals. When we talk about ethic, the question of peace is something fundamental because nothing can be built, nothing can be realized in countries, young countries as ours, without making sure we're in a safe environment, a secure environment, and a peaceful environment. And we have considered that the peace education in complex environments as ours. This question was important and communication had to be in the core to be able to build an idea of peace and prosperity. And our countries are very complex, our cultures are complex, and our relations to other states is complex. That's why we had to build amongst us a culture of peace, a culture of peace for Africans and for institutions as ours. And our existence depends on this culture of peace. That's why amongst the missions that were given to us, we have stratified our different levels of intervention those different levels speak about institutional aspects and then infrastructures. What do I mean by that? On the institutional level, linked to the culture of peace is firstly our schools. Our schools have set up curriculums to start teaching ethics to the citizens based on the respect of others, the respect of humans, the respect of everyone. We have a chance, some of the countries that are member of our institution have a diversity of culture, of religions. And our question was, how can we make sure all this diversity can live in peace, in coherence? That's how, in our own institution, we have created curriculums that are destined to the higher levels of administrations because that's where the conflicts are happening to try to control the powers. And that's where, what, where the difficulty comes. So we have invited in our trainings the different member states, representatives of member states that started coming, communicating, teaching their experience to start constructing in Africa a culture of coexistence, a culture of mutual respect in which tolerance reigns. Unfortunately or fortunately, every society creates different ideals and those different ideals are not always compatible with each other. And even if they were compatible, they are not commutable whether we are in this context or that context. That's why in the Kafrad, we have started acting on the higher levels of managements and then on the medium level of managements, touching intermediate agents. And with them as well, we have put in place programs that facilitated exchange of experience about different subjects in relation with the management and the coherence in the administration. And we've worked also with defense departments, security departments on different levels, like associations, NGOs, and women associations. A year ago, 
We have organized in Abidjan a big African conference dealing with the subject of the condition of women. And we have studied the role of women in African societies as an intermediate of the culture of peace. Because in our societies, the women are not just our mothers, our sisters, our spouses, our daughters. They are the pillars, the pillars of our countries because they are the ones representing the link between the father with his authority and the children of the family. That's why we have insisted on the pacification of the social bonds and the role of women in bringing peace to African societies. And when you give autonomy to women, you open new opportunities for her to solve problems in the family, but also on a society level. We have also put in place programs to promote intellectual creation and art creation. And on those different fields, our mothers, spouses, daughters and sisters can play a fundamental role. We have also worked with universities in which we have put in place a program to facilitate the universities exchange of experience, and we count on them to develop ethic and to develop a culture of peace, tolerance and respect. I was talking about the complexity of our societies, and those societies are very heterogeneous. Different beliefs, different religions, different tribes, different traditions, different cultures, and a lot of representatives from different colors. Africa is very specific because there is a very, very large diversity of ethnic origins, and to have all those communities cohabitate together. We have to create integrated systems for them to cooperate towards development and prosperity. And it has never been easy. That's why an institution as ours have been created. During the past 30 years, we have experienced different aspects. In the 90s, we have started listening to a new discourse talking about pluralism, liberalism, democracy, and this very specific period has been interesting because we have realized our weaknesses, our intrinsic fragilities and weaknesses, but we have also realized our strengths and all the experience that we had gathered from the past years. The weaknesses first was the resurgence of ethnical feelings, ethnical identities, something that our leaders had, had tried to put the state in the core of every country. And as an actor to the transformation towards development, but the resurrection of this new discourse talking about liberalism, democracy, have been favoring the religion, 
the culture of one tribe instead of promoting the state. And this has been at the origin of wars in our countries. Some of the conflicts that were happening with neighbor countries have started inside the same country. And CAFRAD also have been active on this very specific topic, gathering representatives from all those countries to create new ways of resolving conflict when they appear. We have seen alternative modes to resolve conflicts. And we have considered to get back to the traditional structures was fundamental. They brought their experience and the proximity that they had with their populations. And thanks to their help, we have found specific traditional ways to resolve conflicts when those conflicts happened. The peace education is for us not only a far concept, but it's a tradition, it's a projection, it's an experience, a daily experience of the coexistence, peaceful coexistence between the different diversified ethnical groups of our society. That's why in our institutions, besides the traditional structures linked to the governance, we have created a new concept that we named the responsible public governance. The notion of good governance was creating some misunderstanding for us, because what does good mean? Because when you execute it, it could create frustrations, suffering. Yet when we talk about governance, it's to improve the existence, an improvement in the quality of people living together and quality of life in an organized system with rules or inside a family. But the value of good could not be understood by all and it could not be shared by all with the same criteria. That's why we have preferred to the notion good governance is a responsible governance. We mean by responsibility first to be responsible we have to be aware of us, conscious of ourselves as a human being and with all the respect it means. And when we take conscious of ourselves, we can take consciousness and be conscious of the other person that deserves as well dignity and respect. And when we go from dignity and respect for all, then if we need arbitration or if we need to bring people together, will bring forth a culture of peace, a culture through respect, a peace through knowing the other and recognizing the other, different from us, but identical to us as a human, with the same rights, the same values, and the same dignity. That's why, in the CAFRAD, the understanding of a responsible governance is based on three pillars. The first pillar is the authenticity, authenticity, making me who I am and making you who you are 
and the other one is who he is. And this authenticity requires that the one who holds a culture accepts his culture, accepts who he is, not rejecting the other, but respecting the other. And this first pillar is the self-knowledge, the knowledge of the self and the recognition of the other one. The second pillar in our concept of responsible governance is the permanent attention you give to universality. What do we mean by that? We mean to say that it's not because I'm different that I cannot get closer to the other one. There is a link between authenticity and universality, because links can be built between us and the other and guarantee a peace culture. The third pillar is the transmission from one generation to the other one of what we have learned and the knowledge, because it's part of our cultural patrimonial, and this patrimonial has to be transmitted from one generation to the other and guarantee a peaceful existence between the different generations in a diversified environment. The old, older say harmony comes from differences, and yes, we have to accept those different visions to the other one, but the complementarity is getting us closer one to another. That's why the subject on which we have been invited to talk is consubstantial to our existence as an international organization, an African organization, because we believe that we cannot exclude any part of the world. We are all part of the same world. And that's what Dr. Frederico Mayor wanted to transmit in his long career as a doctor, as a diplomat, as a political politician, and I'm grateful to him because he gave this vision, this perspective to humanity. Peace is not only to prevent a conflict or a danger or a war. Peace is not buying military equipment to prevent a war that could result from different things, but peace is fundamentally a spirit, a culture, a tradition we have to build. One of the big challenges that we have to face is to know whether the asymmetries of the geopolitical forces are they incompatible with the culture of peace. We believe that our responsibility can force us sometimes to use power to refrain to contain the velleities of our human passions. The dissuasion can be useful to limit the irrational expression of our passions. That's why the Kafra is attached to the necessity of creating a culture of peace in Africa and yet stay open to other spaces to learn from other experiences that would that would enrich our environment and will help us to build an environment safer, more just and more secured. And we have worked with the 
Army Academy of Cameroon. We have worked with the government of Burkina Faso. We have worked with the government of Mali with initiatives having as an objective to construct, to build a culture of peace on the whole continent. That's why I would like again to express my gratitude and my friendship to Dr. Frederico Mayor for this wonderful, beautiful initiative he took to construct the concept of the culture of peace that is today one of our line of work. Thank you very much for your attention. Against the dying of the light 